because this is so this is so fascinating to me. It's so full, and everything about Ephesians is just full. We'll take it. Remember where uh, Paul is encouraging the church. Is, this is just a rich letter filled with the gospel, filled with all the good things of the gospel. But it's also a call to call the battle into victory. The Lord wants us to live in victory. How many know that? Do you know that? Do you, do you know that He wants us to live in victory? And I, I don't believe in a God who just sets back and says, I'm going to let him flounder. I believe there's a God who, that he's a God who, when we call upon him, he delivers. He delivers us. He doesn't answer every prayer that we pray the way we would like. I'm not going to give you any reasons why. I'm not going to give you the... The easy answer of saying, he always answers your prayer, just might be no. I don't know why he doesn't answer some of our prayers, except I know this, that he gives us grace. He gives us the grace to live where we are with what we have in him and trust him for our future, trust him for our lives in every way, shape, or form. This passage begins like this, and you can read it out loud with me. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh. Stop right there. How many Jews do we have in the room this morning? Any Jewish people? Are you Jewish? All right. Yeah. Very cool. How many non-Jews do we have in the room this morning? Okay. So that makes you a Gentile. A Gentile. There are various words for the term Gentile. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna dig those words out. One, it's a Yiddish word, it's kind of an interesting word. It's called Goyim. But don't walk around calling yourself a Goyim. I'm a Goyim. Unless you hit your thumb with a hammer, that's a good word. I'm a Goyim. But it basically means you're a dog. <laughs> okay, so don't don't do that. Because Gentiles were considered dogs. This is what Paul is talking to talking about with the Ephesians. The Ephesians are Gentiles, predominantly Gentiles. There are a few Jews scattered among them, and he's going to be addressing them as well in this passage. But he says, therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, he's asking them to remember where they came from, how they were considered by a certain group of people to be less than worthy of anything from God. He's going to speak to that same group of people a little bit later and say that all of the ordinances and all of the commandments that they had that made them feel elevated above everyone else, Jesus abolished. Now, he didn't abolish the commands. He didn't abolish the principles behind the law. He didn't abolish any of that. What he abolished was the dividing wall that they had built up because of the ordinances and because of the law that they said they followed and believed they followed that made everyone else lower than humans. Dogs. And he's telling these Ephesians, you need to remember where you came from. So we're going to look at that in just a moment. He says, you were once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by who? By those so-called of the circumcision. What is that? That's weird, okay? Do we got to talk about that in church? Yippee-skippy, we do. <laughs> we do, because there was a covenant in blood that God made with Abraham. That blood was of animals. When God said to Abraham, I'm making a covenant with you, he told Abraham to gather several animals, types of animals, an oxen, a sheep, a, a bird, various animals, and then he was to cut them in two, oh, this is kind of weird, cut them in two and lay them out as if they have had a, a big sharp knife just from head to toe, cut them in two and lay them out on the ground, and they were all laid out. And in the process of that, Abraham went into a trance. The scripture says that the Lord himself put him into a trance. What is that? A trance in this instance isn't a mystical weird thing. It was simply he immobilized Abraham so he could not move and opened Abraham's eyes to see a vision. 
And that way, Abraham was a non-participant in the covenant. This is amazing. This is from Genesis chapter 12. And so God comes and he, as a torch of fire or a torch of light, he walks and passes through those slain animals, those splits of animals, and he proclaims the covenant. He proclaims upon himself the covenant. And he is making a covenant. Abraham is not a participant of that covenant in any way, shape, or form other than by God including him. But God makes a covenant, and he's making a covenant with the seed of Abraham. What's the seed of Abraham? The seed of Abraham means that somewhere along his lineage, there's going to be one who is going to come that is going to cut that covenant with God. And so Abraham is, he's like, he can't even talk. He, he can't speak. All he can do is watch God make this covenant. And after God does that and he proclaims himself and he proclaims the covenant, then he, he allows Abraham finally to wake up. Now a little bit later on, he's going to tell Abraham, I want you right now to go and be circumcised. You circum I think he tells him to circumcise himself. I'm not meaning to get graphic, but holy Toledo, Lord. Please. But he circumcises himself and circumcises all the men of his household. So that was his part of entering into the covenant. You see, without the shedding of blood, you can't come into the proper covenant. That would be a remission of sins without the shedding of blood. And so that would become the mark of the seed of Abraham. That would become the mark of all the people of Abraham. This would be the people that God chose. Because from Abraham, God is going to... He is going to bring forth a nation from a man who is too old. In fact, Scripture says he's dried up. He's, when he receives the covenant, he's already 75 years old. But by the time the covenant comes into some sort of fulfillment, the dude is 99 years old when the Lord shows up to him and says, uh, by the way, I'm coming by next year again. And when, you, when I come back next year, uh, Sarah, who's... 89 years old, will have had a baby. And Sarah's behind in the tent, because this is a man thing happening here, amazing, but she's listening, because that's what women know how to do, they're going to listen. And she's listening, and she hears the Lord say, Sarah's going to have a baby when I come back next year, she goes, <laughs> that's impossible. And her thoughts were, my poor husband is dried up and I'm long past the ability. My womb is like a shriveled up cocoon. It's gone. And the Lord hears that. She, did, she laughed to herself did, out loud. The Lord says, uh, why did Sarah laugh? I didn't laugh. <laughs> She's back in the tent, remember? <laughs> yes, you did. You laughed. And I'm sure the Lord was laughing there too because the Lord loves to do the impossible. Less than a year later, about nine months later, by the way. Oh, man. We don't have any 99-year-olds here, but all I'm thinking of is, is Jewel. You know, wow. <laughs> Bless her heart. But that's the picture. God does something that is impossible with me. And what does he do? She bears a son, and they name him. She names him. She names him what? Isaac? It's up. It's up. What does Itzhak mean? Laughter. <laughs> Laughter, because this is an impossibility. This is funny. I'm 99. I'm 89 years old. I'm 90 years old. This is funny. I'm going to have a baby. <laughs> From that baby springs forth Esau and Jacob. God chooses Jacob. From Jacob comes 12. From the 12 then comes 70 people. 70 people are in a famine, and the Lord sends them to Egypt where they're protected in a place called Goshen. And for, for, for a couple of centuries, they're just thriving. They're multiplying, man, and they're becoming a great nation. And then one rises up who did not have the history of Joseph. Remember that story? And he says, well, this, these people are more than we are. They're more people than we are. They're bigger. They're stronger than we are. Look how they're thriving. We've got to do something. So they so slaughter all the male, or put the word out to slaughter all the male children. And then they put... They put Israel into bondage. 
And God said, it's going to happen so that I can bring them out. And they're going to want to leave their happy home in Egypt. And he does. And so he brings them out. Now, the long story short, he brings them back to the land that he promised to Abraham, where Abraham walked. And said, every place your foot walks, that's going to be your land. And he gives the measurements in the scripture, by the way. And they come back into the promised land, and Israel then becomes a nation. Under David, there's a nation that is born as a whole nation of all the 12 tribes, as Judah and the 10 tribes of the northern part of the kingdom come together, and David is proclaimed king, and you have 70 years of Israel being a nation. Isn't that exciting? The law was given to Israel. The Old Testament, the Torah, is given to Israel. It is a guide for them. It is a reason for being for them. All the laws are for them. It's not for the Gentiles. The law is not for the Gentiles. The sacrificing of animals are not for the Gentiles. It is for the Jews. It was to show the Jews that even though they were chosen by God, there is no way, no how, no way to say that the law and the sacrifices are going to put you in right standing with God. They were supposed to proclaim the glory of God and His great mercy to all of the Gentiles so that all of the nations would look at what was happening with them and they would say, I want their God. My God is a peon. He's a fake, he's a false, he's a fraud, but their God, look at what He does. But people being people, even the covenant people of Israel, have the sin streak alive in them, and they begin to follow after the gods of the Gentiles and follow after the things of the flesh. And Israel didn't fulfill its role. Even when Messiah came to Israel, through Israel, through Jacob, all the way down through Abraham, even though Messiah came, who rejected him? His own people rejected. Now, the gospel then is pushed, the gospel is released by Jesus himself after his death and his resurrection. He tells his disciples, he tells all of them, not just the 12 minus 1, he tells all of them who are following him. It, the scripture says that he was seen by all of those disciples, and he was seen by more than just the 11. He was seen by this one, that one, this one, that one, and 500 others at one time. And so we know that he has, now, after the... After the death and resurrection, there's more than 12. In fact, there are 120 who have been meeting together in the upper room. Scripture says 120 were meeting together in an upper room. And they're doing church business. They still don't get it that there's about to be a fire lit in them and on them. And when it is, they are going to take the gospel to the world. Who is the world? Is that to the Jewish world? The Jews are, are bottled up little people at that time in Israel that aren't even a nation, and the rest of them are scattered in little pockets through the world, but they're to take the gospel to the whole world. Who's the whole world? Say it with me, Gentiles. There's a lot packed into this. Now, the Ephesians have heard the gospel. In fact, they have, they have been evangelizing their own region of Asia so that every town and every village in Asia have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are churches planted everywhere, and the Ephesian church is the largest in the world. It really was the largest church in the world. It, it was thought that over 5,000 people were part of the Ephesian church. That doesn't mean it was a mega church all meeting together in one place, but it was all throughout the city, pockets of people worshiping the same Lord and under the same ministration of the teaching of the apostle Paul. Amazing. Somewhere along the line, Paul is telling them, I want you to remember where you were. Where were you? You were called uncircumcised by those who were circumcised. He says that at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, the, the idea here is he is wanting them to remember so that they don't become what later on the Scripture says they become. He doesn't want them to become lazy in their walk. He doesn't want them to become hardened in their heart. He doesn't want them to lose the fervor of what it means to be saved. 
He doesn't want them to lower their standard of what it means to worship the Lord and shrug their shoulders and just say, I'm saved and I'm on my way to heaven and so my life can just be like whatever it was before. He wants them to remember, no, you were not included in any way, shape, or form in the promises of God. That's a bad way to be. That's without hope. Can you imagine being without hope of salvation? Of, uh, uh, without hope of having an eternity that is anything other than horrid torment and solitary confinement? Or may, maybe you can imagine yourself as being like one who doesn't believe there's an afterlife and you're just going to live. You have no hope whatsoever. What's the point of even living if there isn't life that goes on? What's the point? That's hopelessness. That's despair. You can have hopelessness and despair with a smile on your face. With a beer in your hand. <laughs> you can be happy and happier than you get the more that you participate in life because eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. What a hopeless life that is. And Paul said, remember where you came from. Wow, you were aliens. You want to know how, God, how bad it got for the Gentiles? The, the circumcision considered the Gentiles, any Gentile. These are the, these are the haughty Jews. These are the, the ones who are built up by the law and built up by the, by the commandments. And, and we serve the true and living God. And he only listens to us and he only loves his covenant people because we follow the commandments. Yay. Everyone else, listen to what they would say about Gentiles. Every one of the Gentiles, all they are is fuel for the fire. They're just fuel for the fires of hell. God's got to have a hell. He's got to have the fire of hell. Guess who, guess who is designated as fuel for the fires of hell? How many Gentiles were in the room? Raise your hand. You, you, you. They were aliens. They were designated strangers. They were without covenants. They were without even the possibility of drawing near to God. You want to know how bad it was? It was like this. There's a temple. Right? There's a temple mount today. There's no temple on the temple mount, but there used to be a temple on the temple mount. It was big, beautiful, massive. As far as... The eye could see it looked like it, but it was just actually a small building. It was only 45 feet deep, and it was only 30 feet wide, and it, you know, it was pretty tall, but it was ornate, it was beautiful, it was wonderful. And then they had all these other buildings around it. And they had areas called courts. The only ones who could come into what was called the holy place or the holy area, the area from the altar to the doorway, were the priests. Any Jew could come through the gate up to the altar area to bring a sacrifice. So only the Jews, and then only men. Only men could bring the sacrifice beyond the gate to the altar. Outside the gate then is the first court. The first court outside of that is called the court of the women. So the women could come right up to the open gate they could even, if they didn't have a husband, they could bring a sacrifice right up to the open gate, but they couldn't go in. So they had to have an advocate. They would have a priest. They would have one of the Levites come, and that Levite then would represent them by taking their, their sacrifice to the altar, slaughtering it, and doing the sacrifice. So the women couldn't even come in the gate. But the gate was open. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that wonderful? And then way back off in the corner, in a lower pocket... What was what was called the courts of the Gentiles. And there was no gate in. There wasn't a gate into the women. Then there was no certainly gate into the courts within the temple. So there was a wall. They could see the sacrifices being performed because the altar was elevated. And they could look from their little pocket of the Gentiles. They could look above the wall that was created there. And they could see the sacrifices happening. So they let them come in. But on top of the wall, this sign 
said, this is the court of the Goyim. This is the court of the Gentile. This is the dog pound. Worse than that, it is said that there was a sign in place that said, death to any dog who dares to approach the holy place. Amazing. Now, I'm not painting a picture of racial or ethnic discrimination against the Jews right now, but that's how they were because they did not understand the covenant and the promises that were given to them, but they were supposed to be a blessing to a world that was lost. They weren't supposed to be the haughty, proud, stiff-necked people that they were who, who kept everybody out of the distance so that even when Messiah came and said, I've come to the whole world, even bread is thrown to the dogs, guys. They said, no way, no how. We're going to kill you because you've equated yourself with God and you would be so bold as to be with Gentile. And worse, you associated with Gentile women. The woman at the well in Samaria is a Gentile. And Jesus is talking to her. She's not only a Gentile woman. She's a Gentile woman dog. Do you follow? This is how far and how lost Gentiles were with no hope, no covenant, no promises, no ability to even come close to what God had prepared for them because there was a wall. There was a wall, and the wall was created. Because not of the Jews, but because of sin. Now, look what it says. I'm going to go a step further. But now. I love that. Say it with me. But now. But now. A couple weeks ago we did... Uh, but God, it was but God. Before that was boom. Get over the boom. No, this is a good boom moment. But God. Boom. But now, in Christ, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off. Now, do you understand what it means to be far off? That's what it means. Now, as sinners, as, as normal, everyday, run of the mill sinners in the world, we are separated from God because of sin. What's the wall? The wall is sin. You were once far off, but now you've been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace and has made both one. Oh, uh, what, what, what are we talking about? What's one? Who's both? One. The Jews who have misunderstood and lost sight of the truth of the promises in the covenant and are acting like big, haughty ninnies, and the Gentiles are separated far away because they can't come near because of sin and because of the big, haughty ninnies. <coughs> Jesus does something to make the big, haughty ninnies not big, haughty ninnies anymore. And the lost Gentiles, not lost Gentiles anymore. And now they're one. Oh my goodness. For he himself is our peace who has made both one. And has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. There's the first one. He's abolished in his flesh the enmity. So Jesus came. We know this. This is the gospel. You know this, right? This is the good news. That you're a sinner. That's the bad news. You're a sinner and have no hope. You're a sinner and you're separated because of your sin. You have no hope. There's no hope! You can't be good enough. We read it in Ephesians chapter 2 just a couple verses ago. It is by grace that you are saved through faith, not of works. Right? It is by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. Who's boasting? Our Jewish friends. We're boasting. And they missed it too. The Gentiles are lost because they're sinners. The Jews are lost because they're sinners. They just think they're saved. 
And that's trouble. What does Jesus do? In his own flesh, he bridges the gap. He takes down the wall. Here's the wall. He breaks the enmity. That is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two. The word man there is not one person. It's one new body, one new entity, one new enterprise, one new something special. And what is that? Could anybody name to what that is? What is it? The church. It's, it's the body of Christ. It's his body. We're both one. So we're no longer separated by Gentile or Jew. Praise God. In fact, we're not separated by men from women. Thank God. We're not separated from older to younger. Thank God. We're not separated Jew to Gentile. Thank the Lord. We're not. We're separated from sinners that we once were. Remember what you once were. When you came to Jesus Christ, you came out of enmity. You were enemies with God. Maybe you didn't even know it, but your sin made you on the wrong side of the war, the spiritual war. You were enemies, but then you came to Christ because of what he did, and now you're not enemies anymore. You're, you are what? Family. Saved. Hallelujah. If that doesn't make it happy right now, I don't know what is. I, 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 don't, I don't know what is. I, I can't tell you how powerful that is, but we hear it so much, it's like, <laughs> and that's why Paul is telling the Ephesians, remember where you once were, because you're going. You're used to it. It's not new to you. He goes on. Thus making peace that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And then he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near, for through him we have access into, by one spirit, to the Father. Okay, so Paul is challenging them and uh, he's letting them know that there is no more separation. There's no more excuse. You are totally given the truth. You are given the word. You are given something because something was broken. There's a picture of this. I'm going to read this. I don't believe I put this up on slides. If they do, Gabe will catch it. But it's Matthew chapter 27, verses 51 through 54. This is so interesting to me. Adrian had a question on this. Oh, it must have been a couple weeks ago. And and Diane had a question on this a few months ago, but here's what it says. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two. So Jesus is on the cross, and something happens when he goes, Into your hands I commit my, commit my spirit. And the scripture says he died. He gave up his spirit. He gave up the ghost. What happened? The earth shook, and the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those who were with him regarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, and they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Such a hard passage, but there's such a powerful moment in this because Matthew is giving a, a, a scenario. He's giving, he's giving the whole picture without explaining the whole picture. Now let me break it down to you from the other Gospels. Here's what happened. Jesus gives up the ghost. Jesus is on the cross for what? Class? Our sins. And according to this verse, the sins of who? Jews and Gentiles. The Gentiles are totally without God. They don't even have a law. They don't, they're just floundering like zombies, like we talked about spiritual zombies last week or a week ago. They're just dead in their, They're just dead in spirit. They're dead. They're separated from God. They're just walking around living like zombies. Not the movie zombies, but inside they're zombies. But the Jews have the truth. They have the covenants. They have the promises. And the Paul says, this is a schoolmaster that's to show you there's one better who's coming. But some of the Jews of the Old Testament believed on what was coming, and they were called the saints. 
They're great people, wonderful people that we read about. In fact, Hebrews 11 tells us about a few of them. There's Abraham, there's Sarah, there's Jacob, there's Isaac, there's, man, there's Moses, there, there's Samson, there's all of these. Even Samson was a moron. He still believed in the Messiah who was coming. And, and these are the ones who are termed saints. So there's lots of people who have died there in the grave. They're in a place called Sheol means the place of the grave. It's called Abraham's bosom. It's like locked in right across the street from hell. You just can't cross the street. Long story. But they're waiting for the Messiah to come. And suddenly Messiah comes. He lives his life. He ministers for three and a half years showing that he is the son of God. That God loves everyone. And then he goes to the cross and pays for every sin that was ever committed or will ever be committed. He pays the price for every single one of them. And he becomes sin for us. And he dies with that. And the earth shook because creation was groaning for something to happen. The earth shook. Now whether the earth shook and opened those graves immediately, we don't know for sure. But they didn't come out of the graves for three days. Which makes me think Matthew was just giving this narrative to, set, to give the whole picture before he narrows it down. So something happened. Certainly with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the earth shook. So when Jesus came out of the grave, here's what I believe, and I believe the interpretation from the other Gospels is, not only did the earth shake when the cross happened, when Jesus gave up the ghost, it shook, and God took his fingers and went to that veil, which is the dividing wall between all mankind and his own presence, and went... That veil was this thick. The earth shook and God went, rip. Three days later, Jesus rose from the dead and the earth shook. And the graves of the saints were opened up. And they came out, not as zombies, not as dead guys walking around, it was the first fruits of the resurrection of which Jesus was the very first of the first fruits. Amazing. Okay, what does that mean? It means the wall is torn down. He's wanting the Gentiles to remember. He's wanting us to remember. He's wanting us to understand that by the blood of Jesus Christ, something happened. What happened? Here's a couple of them. We have peace. He is our peace who has broken down every wall. He's our peace. I don't know if you've been paying attention to what's happening in Israel right now. Has anybody had your eye? I mean, it's so easy to not see the news. Most news is garbage. and most I'm telling you, most news is garbage. It's so bad, it's garbage. <laughs> the last couple of days, Israel has been under invasion and right now over 600 civilians, men, women, and children have been slaughtered or kidnapped and brought back into Gaza Strip and slaughtered. I'm not going to get into the politics of the Palestinians. There's no such thing as a Palestinian. No such thing. And so now all these rockets are going back and forth again. You have all the slaughter of people and you now have rockets coming from the north and you have what appears to be the beginnings of a fulfillment of at least two scriptures. Ezekiel 38 is in the makings and another one is Zechariah chapter 12 which talks about the surrounding nations of Israel suddenly coming in on an attack. Now let me share something with you. This is a little bit of prophecy. Please listen. Yesterday was the last day of what is known as Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. The day of the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. It's a seven day long feast. And that seven-day-long feast ended on the very day that this new war started. Fifty years to the day from when the 1973 Yom Kippur war, war started. Fifty years to the day from September 29th. On the Jewish calendar, September 29th was the same day. Tishri, something or another. And on that day in 1923, the League of Nations declared that it was finally okay for Jews to own land in what they called Palestine. 
Palestine means Philistine. The Romans named it Palestine. They named it after the Philistines who were Israel's great enemies. And they scattered the Jews and named the land Philistine, the land of the Philistines, even though there weren't any Philistines. 1923, Israel fulfilled a scripture where the Lord says in Leviticus chapter 3, when you come into the land and own the land, start counting. 50 years later is the year of Jubilee. 50 years later after that is the year, and 50 and 50 and so on. So what happened Friday was the second Jubilee. The second Jubilee. What does that mean? What does it mean? The Jubilee year is the year in which everything is set free. If you bought land from another Jew on the year of Jubilee, that land went back to him. Unless he didn't want it. If you had an indentured Jew who couldn't pay their bills and you've indentured them and they're your slave in the year of Jubilee, that person is set free. And there's this great principle that happens in the year of Jubilee. Jesus stood up in the synagogue and he opened the scripture on his very first day of ministry. Stepped in the synagogue, he opened to that verse in Isaiah chapter 61 and he said, I'm here to proclaim to you the acceptable year, though, the year of Jubilee. This is now, this is now fulfilled in your hearing. And Jesus set the captive free. Why? Do I go in the middle? Because right now the Jewish people are under siege and it's going to get worse for them. The Bible says it. We are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. What does that mean? We are to pray for that they live in peace. The scripture says they're not going to be in peace. It's going to get bad for them. So what does that mean? Oh Lord, bring peace. Let there be peace. No. When they come to peace, all hell is going to break loose. Here's what it means. Pray that this verse right here, where they have been blinded, they've set up this wall, they believe in the covenants, they believe in the principles of the law, it's blinded them to the point we're needing to pray for them right now that they say, see peace because he is our peace. Jesus is our peace. I said all that to say this. You guys, gals, have access to peace. Because the walls have been torn down and some of you aren't living in peace in your heart because you're all in turmoil, maybe because of the circumstances of your life or this or that, or you're feeling guilty or shameful. You have access to peace. Come to peace. Come to Jesus. Wow. Second one. We're one body. We talked about that. Ephesians 2.17 says he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. He preached to both, both of us. And number three, the access. Here it is. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18. Through him we both have access. This is the last line. By one spirit in, to the Father. That means no separation. John 7.37 says it this way. I think this is up on a screen here. Remember what you are, but now let's get through all this. Let's get through that. Let's get through this one. Here it is. On the last day, the great day of the feast, oh, I love this. Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So yesterday ended the Feast of Tabernacles. It's called Simchat Torah, and that's the last of the seven days, but the Feast of Tabernacles is eight days long, eight days long. God added another day. It's right there. He said, have an eighth day. Do the seventh day. Return to Torah, which means repetition of quoting the verses in the synagogue daily. Simchat Torah. He said, but have an eighth day. Guess what today is? This very day is the eighth day. It's called Shemini Atzeret, and it's it's a term that means the great last day. On the last day of the feast, Jesus stood up, and this happens every year at the Feast of Tabernacles, but on that great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and he said, when the priests are going down to the pool of Siloam to get a bunch of water, and some good water from Siloam, they're going to bring that back up the steps all the way up to the top of the mountain, and they're going to cleanse the altar with that water to start a whole new year of sacrifice. 
That's what they're doing. They're going to start all over, cleansing the altar, pouring that on the altar, cleansing the altar, and said, okay, now let's do it all again. Let's start memorizing and speaking the words, and let's start killing animals. But Jesus said, if you're thirsty, come unto me, and I will give you a drink. I'll give you a drink. So Jesus is saying, come to me. The water that you're going to get isn't going to go back to try to prove yourself before God. And it isn't to go back and slaughter sacrifices to somehow be acceptable for God until you sin the next time. It is now, come to me, and the water that comes into you will be like a river and, and springing up to eternal life. What does that mean? It means that continual washing of the Spirit of God in your life all the time. All we need to do is come and confess it when we're wrong, when we do wrong. All we're coming and saying, Lord, I agree, that was just wrong. You don't have to embellish it. Sometimes you do stupid stuff and it brings pain and yeah, it brings some tears and it does bring some remorse, but even that remorse isn't going to clean you. What cleans you is what Jesus did on the cross and you come to him and he cleanses you from unrighteousness and the water is continually flowing. Can I get a praise God for that? <laughs> Two more verses and then we're going to end it. Look at, the, uh, look at the words here. I'm going to back up. Let all who are thirsty do what? Yeah, there it is. What? Do what? Come. Oh, how's this one start? Come to me, all who are, who labor and are heavy laden. The word translates weary and burdened down. What's he do? I'll give you rest. I know you're weary. I don't necessarily mean physically tired, just weary of the spiritual battle. Come on, confess it. It's a good confession. Weary of the battle. What's he do? Come to him. What's he do? The rest is yours. Do you believe that? Do you believe the word's true? How many are weary again? All right, raise your hand. Okay, now let's just keep your hand up. Put up the other hand and say, oh, let's balance this out. Lord, we need rest right now. We're coming to you. In fact, we're already here. We're in your presence. We're, you're here with us. You've already been ministering to us. Give us rest. Come on, say that. Give me rest. Give me rest. I come to you. Give me rest. Whoa. Next verse. Let us, therefore, what? Come boldly to the throne of what? Grace. Favor. That's unmerited favor. He has favor on you and you didn't earn it. <laughs> you never can. Oh, but he'll, he'll obtain mercy. That's not getting what you deserve. And grace, that's getting what you don't deserve. To help you in your time of need. How many are in time of need right now? Raise up your hand. Okay, now stand up. Let's end this. I said all of that to say this one little thing we have Access because the wall has been torn down. Remember that. If this was the Pepsi deal, man. Man. Missy. It fits with the Pepsi thing. It fits with whatever you went through earlier. It fits here because you're saying, I'm not, I don't have to go with that. It's not going to give me rest. It's just going to give me a buzz that's going to have a crash a little bit later on. That I'm not going to enjoy, and if, if, depending on this, the, the the level of depth that you're seeking some sort of a buzz from, the crash is going to be even greater. He says we can come to him and have access right now. Now you raised your hand a minute ago and said you believe the word, didn't you? Did you not? <coughs> Did I misunderstand you? No. Did I misunderstand anybody? No. I just want to make sure we're on the same page, on the same paragraph, down the same sentence, and on the same word. <coughs> Access. Do you believe the word? Yes. Come on, do you? Yes. You do. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Do that tomorrow. Because we've done it today, haven't we? I think we've already done it enough today. We're there. We're there. Thank you, Jesus! <laughs> but tomorrow, when the God, after the Pepsi, these kids are driving me crazy. Not your own kids, but the kids you work with at school. 
Sometimes both. He's turned down the dividing wall on that one. They're all driving you crazy. So you reach for the Pepsi, right? Or you reach for the chocolate? Or you reach for the whatever. Go to the throne first. Go to the throne. You have access. Isn't that cool? Whether you're Jewish in Christ or Gentile in Christ, there's now no longer Jew or Gentile. It's just free access to all of us who believe. You know that what makes me want to do? Jump. <laughs> That's all I'm doing. Can you raise up a hand and repeat after me? Thank you, Thank you. Father, Father, for saving me. For saving me. I, believe in you. I believe in you. I believe God raised you from the dead. You, you died for my sins. For my sins. You, rose you rose again from the dead so that I am set free. And I have eternal life, have eternal life. In, Jesus Christ. in Jesus Christ. No matter what happens with this body, I'm getting a new one, and I'm with you forever. No more sorrow, no more sickness, no more pain, no more separation, eternal access, all the time, every day, every night, every hour, every minute, forever, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you.